Okay, well, it's my, uh, my privilege to introduce our speaker uh, this morning. Uh, last year, actually, sometime in the spring, uh, Gordy Isaac, our dean of the chapel, saw me in the hallway down there in the catacombs of uh, Goddard Library and said, David, we would really like to have somebody speak in chapel who knows something about the workplace. Uh, do you know anybody like that who could maybe speak in chapel about faith at work? <clears throat> and I said, you know, actually, I do. And so here's my draft, my draft list. And my number one draft choice is a woman down in New York City named uh, Catherine Leary Alsdorf. And so, Catherine, why don't you come up here as I tell them a little bit about you. Uh, I actually met Catherine in 2002. I've known her brother actually longer than that. He's currently, uh, Paul Leary is currently uh, training in France, trying to master the French language because he's going to be working as a kind of business as mission person in uh, in trying to create businesses as a way of representing the gospel in other parts of the world. It's just an amazing, uh, Tunisia is Tunisia. where he's, yeah. So uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. But I got to meet Catherine when she was actually in her Silicon Valley days before she moved to Redeemer Press, uh, really in 2002, 2003. And uh, I met her, so I met her in her sil Silicon, just post-CEO era, and it was about, the transition was about to happen to go back to New York City, but she was a CEO at several companies in Silicon Valley, uh, so she's had a terrific business experience. She got her MBA at the Darden School of Business uh, at the University of Virginia, uh, and when she went to Redeemer Presbyterian Church, she launched and organized a center for faith at work that is the model from my point of view of what a church can do to relate to the marketplace, the world of the arts, things like that. So when I took my Gordon Conwell, Workplace Theology, Ethics, and Leadership cohort uh, down to New York City a couple Januarys ago, one of the, our definite stops was to go to Redeemer Press's headquarters and listen to Catherine explain what a church can do. Now, that message is in a new book. The, they're actually co-authors of this book, but Catherine's name has three names, and it's a lot shorter, so it had to use a smaller font size. But actually, <laughs> Catherine is the co-author with her pastor of this book, Every Good Endeavor, which is about faith at work and developing a Christian view of the marketplace and the workplace, and actually where most of our church members are going to spend most of their time. So it's really wonderful to have her here. I actually read a lot of books on this topic, and I'm writing one myself. Uh, I say this is the best book there is on this topic, Every Good Endeavor, until mine comes out next year. Uh, my book, Every Great Endeavor. Uh, <laughs> will be coming out, but I'll tell you more about that next year if Gordy Isaac gives me permission. So will you join me in welcoming Catherine Alsdorf. Thank you. Several years ago, I was teaching a class on faith and work at Redeemer, and I was teaching on Genesis 1 and 2. We were going through it very painstakingly, finding every time the word work was referenced, and then we went through and circled every time the word good was mentioned. And I looked back at the, you know, maybe 50-person classroom. In the back row, there was a man sitting there, uh, furrowed brow, concentrating very deeply. And I thought, oh, he's thinking this is really stupid, so I'm starting to get worried. But he came up to me at the end of the class and said, that was amazing. God doesn't make junk. I don't make junk. I have never connected with God like I just did in this moment. And it was a fascinating story. Turns out he was a lawyer turned entrepreneur that had gone into the rug making business. His initial goal was to make a lot of money making rugs and then he would figure out a way with that money to serve the poor. He had factories in Tibet and Armenia and he had a showroom on the Upper East Side. So he had made it in the world of rug making. He was a Christian, but this was an aha moment for him because it was the first time that the work itself mattered, that the rug itself mattered, that he'd been able to make that connection. And he saw himself in that greater biblical story. We've been able to work with him over the years as that story's gone deeper and deeper, and, and there's far more I could tell about what God is doing with him. But it's the kind of work I've been able to be part of 
in New York the last 12 years. So I'm happy to be here. There's lots of cool connections. I did meet David in California early in my Christian faith, as a matter of fact. Um, I've also been part of the Theology of Work project that has involved Haddon Robinson and Alice Matthews and Sean uh, McDonough. And we've gone through actually every book of the Bible and drawn out from that what it has to say about work because there's been such a dearth of resources to help people navigate this arena. So that's exciting. It's actually um, very near completion, and it's free, and it's online, and hopefully you will all have a chance to use it. I also have a connection here, because my niece just graduated over there. <laughs> I can't talk about my niece without getting all choked up. Anyway, she's amazing. And I think you might know that my pastor is an alum from here, so lots of, lots of good connections. My real mission, my real prayer at this point in time is for a huge paradigm shift, shift in churches, um, how to rethink themselves and rethink their mission, and I'm hoping that you are a key to that as faculty, as um, future leaders in the church, but also in how you think about your own work. One of the things that I keep running across when I'm talking to pastors about this is they say, well, I don't, I've never worked out there in the world, so I don't know how to relate on this faith and work topic. And my, my advice is the starting point is your own work. We all are given these places to work, and actually the underlying issues are the same no matter what vocation you're in. So I hope that um, I encourage you to um, think about your own work in this context. So what is this shift? What's this paradigm shift? Um, it's so that churches will focus on work, the theology of work, what God has to say about it, also to the connection between our daily work and culture making or culture shaping and cultural renewal. There's sort of this faith and work ministry area, and then there's a gospel and culture ministry area that's sort of cool and emerging. But there have not been a lot of connections that, in fact, most of the time, the culture shaped through all of us living out our vocation in the institutions and workplaces and fields in which he's called us to. So that, that really tight connection between um, culture change and how we live out our faith and work is important. And then lastly, um, I think it's just one of the more rich areas to actually see the power of the gospel to create change in thinking of how that change occurs in our work. As a result of that, I think we will be seeing an unleashing of the church in ways we haven't seen in a long time. I think we haven't equipped our people to be the church out in those various institutions and culture. I also think we're missing one of the richest opportunities for evangelism out there. There's a very recent Barna study that said that they, they surveyed I think it was under 40 people, but not, you know, some Christians, but, you know, a, a random sampling of the population, and discovered that 75% said that they were looking for ways to work in a more meaningful way to have more meaningful lives. I mean, 75% searching for meaning. 56% said that they want to make a difference in the world, and 40, and on, on the other hand, 46% were desperately afraid of making the wrong career choice. So you've got this interesting sort of dichotomy of wanting to make a difference and yet afraid to take a step in that direction. So there's this huge pain in the world of people who don't know God for the answers that only God can give. And I think our next decade of church evangelism could entirely be focused on this area of ministry. And then secondly, I, or finally, I think it is such a powerful crucible for the gospel. Um, I think the idolatry that we manufacture around our areas of work gets deeper in us than almost any area of our lives. So it's like this, um, this ugly mess that's just waiting for the church to draw God into that um, is a huge opportunity. <clears throat> 
It is ironic that I am speaking here in your chapel because when I was the age of most of you, I had not yet become a Christian, even most of the faculty except for David. <laughs> I, I was not even a Christian, um, but became a Christian sort of mid-career, was already a CEO, and spent the first 10 years of that life as a Christian wrestling what it meant to be a leader in the high-tech world as a Christian. Um, that was not an easy wrestling. And I think in sort of um, frustration, God said, all right, I'm going to take you and put you in a laboratory where you'll actually learn something that'll be more useful. So he picked me up and moved me to New York and to the um, staff of Redeemer. And the, my call was to create a faith and work ministry from my perspective, I mean, I think I did really view it like a lab. And when you go into a lab, you have one big research question. And my research question was, can the gospel really change this? I'd been in this technology world where we actually believed technology was changing the world. I mean, we were the savior. That's, that's the technology story. And so I knew I became a Christian clinging to the promise that the gospel was so much more powerful in technology, that this was the answer to cling to, not, not something else of the world. But I, I, I didn't really feel like I'd seen it in action at a level that was really um, anywhere close to what I could hold up to Apple computer. And so I, I went into this time at Redeemer saying, Lord, sh let me be part of this. Show me this. We need a lab experiment here where we're really, really building into people to see how you do change their work and how you change, change their hearts surrounding the work. And maybe even we'll get to see a little bit of how that work impacts the culture of our city here. So we had the hypothesis that the gospel changes everything, our hearts, our community and world, and that sort of became a mantra of this ministry. The book, Every Good Endeavor, is really the culmination of 10 years of trying on different theologies and different approaches to see what really seemed to sink into the hunger and the need of the people that were moving through our church and our ministry during this period of time. So I'm going to follow the flow of that book today. Um, part one is God's plan for work. Part two is the problems with work, and part three is how does the gospel change that work. So part one, um, I can remember back to early, early in my childhood, just an experience where I think I had a foretaste of what maybe Adam and Eve felt in Eden before the fall about work. I lived in the country, and there were tons of fields and streams and um, little woods around my house. And that was in the day when you could go out and play without anybody watching you. And um, I would go down and move the rocks around the stream and watch the water. You know, like the, there'd all be all these leaves and twigs caught up behind some rocks. And the stream just didn't seem like it was flowing well. And I'd move the rocks, and suddenly the stream would start to flow. Or the next day I'd say, well, let's put some rocks here and dam it up and we'll make a big pond. And I think I had an early taste of that interaction that man was supposed to have with this created world where we actually had a dominion. We actually did something and it changed the created order in some small way. And I think that that, that, that taste of stewardship and dominion is a really amazingly powerful thing that we don't get our hearts and hands around very much. At that time, it was 35 years before I read Genesis 1 and 2 after that. Um, and I think actually Genesis 1 and 2 had been a deterrent. It had been, you know, why you shouldn't believe in Christianity, that strange story of the beginning of mankind. But once I began, it became a Christian, fortunately, a pastor opened up those two passages to me. And I was like, wow. This changes everything. This gives me a story to live in. The power of this is amazing. Now, I thought that could just be me. I'm a little weird and geeky. But over the 10 or 12 years we've been doing this at Redeemer, it has been an opening eyes story, kind of like my friend James that I talked about in the beginning. The, um, the, the concepts that it's God's work and it's good, and he made us in his image, so we can work too. 
it's so intrinsic to who we are, this mandate, this commission to fill the earth and subdue it, this deep untapped potential that work is service. It's the way we love the world. It's the way we live out God's love in the world. It's just so rich. So I, I tell people they should read through the first three or four chapters of Genesis a couple times a year just to, to re-steep themselves in that beginning story. Now, the Bible doesn't stay there for long. It goes to chapter 3. But let's just look at some of these paradigm shifts that, that it sets up for us in ministry. We think of our work as instrumental as opposed to intrinsically good. We think of it as a way to pay for something. We think of it as a way to put our roof over our heads or be responsible or a way to gain power, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but power to influence change, power to contribute to the world. But we rarely think about the intrinsic contribution of the work itself. And I think that's a shift we need to make. We think of, even as Christians, often the product, Protestant work ethic as being enslaving instead of freeing. We don't really think of, of being made for work and needing to do it to be all that we were born to be. And I, I use in the book an illustration of, of friends of mine that we met early in the beginning of our entrepreneurs program that the, the husband was working with handicapped adults, dis, um, developmentally disabled adults. And he worked with them in high school and he noticed that when they left high school, they were put in often a home and given activity, but they declined really rapidly. And he said, the difference that he was observing was in high school, they had a work. Learning was their work. But when they got out of high school, they didn't have any work. So he set about to create work, a real work environment that produced a real product that paid a real wage for these um, disabled adults. He now runs a factory that employs 480 disabled adults. They, it's a packaging plant outside of Philly. It, it wraps like um, and packages Ricola candies and, and things like that. I mean, it has contracts with major um, suppliers. And he's created mechanisms like, like mechanical things that help the handicapped adult work with the machinery that wraps these products so that they actually are contributing to the work. I mean, he's, he's modified the environment some. But he said, you cannot believe the difference in the lives of these 480 people, that they are contributing, they're using their God-given gifts. For me, that's just such a stark example that, um, you know, we sort of think of this working to our full potential as something that, you know, just applies to those of us who've gone to seminary and college and all of that. But here, anyone, you know, this example just shows that every single one of us God made to work and to contribute to this world in some way. So it's a great story. I think there's huge paradigm shifts for us in looking at Genesis 1 and 2. But then we have to go to Genesis 3. Cursed is the ground. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it. It will produce thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. Everything's broken. Everything's um, fallen. Everything's falling apart. You know, sometimes some churches, they spend a lot of time in Genesis 3, a lot of time on the sin part and not on Genesis 1. But other churches don't spend any time on it at all. They just rationalize away the brokenness of the world. You know, it's really pretty good here, and, you know, what can you expect? And I find in our ministry, we actually have to open up people's eyes to the true brokenness around them. Often, they're, I mean, you see it in the social entrepreneurship movement um, of young people today. The only brokenness they're addressing or really seeing is overseas. They're not really seeing, all right, you know, God might be calling me to something right here in my backyard, kind of because we have these blinders to, to the brokenness in our everyday world or our everyday culture. So some part of our ministry has been able to, has been to say, you know, let's just walk down the street. Let's just start from 9 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock and, and try to understand and see the brokenness through God's eyes in the, in the world that we're working in. It makes our work fruitless, it makes our work meaningless, it makes it selfish, and it fills us with an idolatry because we really can't live without telling us ourselves some story that we are living a worthwhile life. 
So we man, if, if we don't have God at the heart of it, we manufacture, and even when we do, sorry, even when we do have God at the heart of it, we manufacture these reasons that we're good people or we're righteous people or we're, we're the best out there. I mean, actually, even pastors do that. They sort of manufacture this, this idolatry of being a pastor and, and somehow their work means more than other people's work um, in God's ultimate economy. But we all do it. Artists think that their work, their, the creativity of their work is closer to the creativity of God. So even Christians do this. And I think that um, we really need to expose this faith and work ministry shines a light on and exposes the level of brokenness in the world around our culture and work, but also in our own hearts around work. It's a hot house. It's an idle factory. Um, even for people within the church, and faith and work ministry exposes them. I'm just going to tell a couple stories. Um, one, one of the first vocation groups we started. We've had a lot of vocation groups, like you know, a lawyer, healthcare, educator, international diplomacy. I mean, anybody who's got a vocation can can get a group going. So one of the first ones to start was a writer, and she came to me and said, you know, I, I'd like to start a group for writers here. We really need to talk to each other and see what God's purposes are in our work. And we had a first meeting, and about 40 people came. But she came to me very upset afterwards and said, you know, I, there were a lot of people there, but they weren't all writers. I mean, you need to know they're not all writers. I have my master's in documentary writing from this prestigious school, and some of them were journalists. <laughs> and I was just sort of stunned that, you know, it, as I started to explore this, I thought, you know, actually everyone in that room is looking around going, well, I'm not sure this group is really for me because it has some of those people that aren't quite as righteous in their career as I am. Well, that was just a foretaste. Wait till the lawyers got together. I mean, <laughs> We had the corporate lawyers and the do-gooder lawyers. Oh, my gosh. I mean, they, they canceled the group at the end of the first meeting by themselves. They said, we need two groups or none at all. And it's just been fascinating. The, I mean, these are people that can serve communion together. They can usher together. They can even work in the children's ministry together. But when it talks about their own careers, suddenly these little status buttons start going off. And they're pretty much looking around the room going, wow, who's better than me or not better than me? And, you know, I should be in this group, not that group. And it's, it's, it can be discouraging unless you look at it as this amazing ministry opportunity that is sitting there inside our churches, but we're afraid to even scratch the surface of to let it reveal itself. And so our, our laboratory has been to try to get underneath that and see what is the, the sin beneath the sin in those idolatries. What are the fears? What are the... Um, what are the attempts to be like God that are, what are the, what's the mistaken theology that basically we're, we're earning our own salvation by how far we get in our career and, you know, we pray for, to God for a little help, but, you know, it's really 5% of what, we're, what we really need here because we're such competent people. So what we've attempted to do in this is to bring the gospel deep into it and see where and what works to create change. I think the, um, the biggest area is hope. Um, nothing will be perfect in the brokenness of the world or our hearts until the day of Christ and the end of the new kingdom come on earth. But to look through ways that we can appropriate the truth of the gospel for a hope right now in the midst of our brokenness has really been an amazing, exciting um, activity. I think this idea of a new storyline for our work, what is it we're working for, has been extraordinarily powerful. Um, the number of, we probably have a thousand people go through some aspect of our ministry during the course of a year, and some we get deep and intense, like our, our fellows program that we bill as a um, sort of a year of seminary without having to get grades. So you all might have wished you had done that one. Well, you don't get any credit for it either. So, um, But anyway, from, from that intensive discipleship to um, just weekend conferences and retreats and classes, but 
the number, I'd say 99% of everyone that we see says, why have I never heard the Genesis to Revelation story of the Bible so that I can understand where my work fits in it before? And I hope that changes. I hope all of you are out there um, teaching in churches as pastors or leaders in some way so that 10 years from now, that's not what we're seeing as walking into our church. I know that campus ministries like InterVarsity are taking this very seriously, and we hope the Theology of Work project will make some dent. But the storyline itself has had um, a huge impact, and I think we've, um, we've seen people cling to the knowledge of God showing up in the midst of their own brokenness or the world's as opposed to just avoiding brokenness or putting a veil over brokenness. So there's, there's been a real richness and depth there. We also teach a little um, picture of how does the gospel work, in a, and it's in a cycle of death and then resurrection and then glory. So you have to die to something inside yourself if you want that idolatry to go away. You know, you have, like, you have to die that you're the to the idea that you're the best in order for God to come in and create in you a new heart so that you can give him glory. But similarly, there's things in the financial industry that had to die in order for that to be renewed by people who had a different vision of what that could be. So this, this sort of process of the gospel works through a death and resurrection kind of a cycle has been very powerful. And I think we've seen um, in, in the people that have gone deeper in theology, we've seen this renewed hope. We've seen this vision for what could be different. So what can you do? Um, we do, for the, especially for faculty, there, there's a dearth of people trained in public theology. As we looked to staff up in the Center for Faith and Work, we're like, where are people who've really had some training in this how does the gospel interact in the world? We're grateful for the work that David's doing up here. And churches need pastors in this area. I'm now consulting with churches all over the, the world, including Australia, saying, where can I find pastors that can work and help our church um, grow in this area of discipleship? And I think our churches are hungering for deeper content. So I just um, implore you to not dumb it down, not shy away from their thirst for that. Um, the theology is all over the place, from... Um, I know what I'm supposed to do at work is to evangelize, but I'm no good at it, so I don't do anything to, you know, God tells me what to wear in the morning, and then my work will go well if I wear the right color. I mean, the theology is all over the map, and they desperately need your help to go deeper in a true um, theological understanding of work. And then personally, I'd like to ask you to invite God to... Um, Help you see where the gospel needs to transform your own work, where you have a, an idolatry or a fear or a, a sense of lack of need for God that just is freezing you up and making you unable to really live out the power of um, having a savior that really is wanting to call you into work that's kingdom um, it's redemptive and, and matters for the, for the entire world and for the kingdom. So um, invitation in all three of those areas. Um, and I'd like to pray, close by praying for you. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I'm so grateful for this seminary. I'm grateful for, as David said, the chance to um, stop the week and um, sing to you pray to you and focus on what your word has to offer us in this area. Lord, I pray that this seminary will be a light in revitalizing the churches of our country and world. I pray that every student here will get a sense of their calling, but also a sense of the calling of each individual inside the church and how they how you want to use them um, as the priesthood of all believers out in the world 
I pray for our churches. I pray that um, our churches everywhere would see this hunger for the gospel and the meaningless of meaninglessness of work for people who don't know you. And I pray for the world that um, in its brokenness, you would give the people in it, the people in our spheres of culture and influence, the eyes to see and the ears to hear your truth and your love and your picture and vision for what this world was meant to be and will be again with the work of your son. In your son's name, amen. Thank you.